but Satan Price, man, he was wise. He was just like, they're playing on your emotions. He's manipulating you, you know, with this baby. And I was just like, yeah, but oh my God, look, it's a baby. And he was dressed like a little Kennedy. I was just like, yeah. little Kennedy. <laughs> uh, yeah, but think about the year. That could be baby Mike Pence for all we know, right? Yeah. I mean, and, uh, yeah. Don't even. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. Would you, would you kill Hitler if he went back and he was only eight? <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because the kidnappers had really weird demands. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath will be unable to join us today, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm amazing noah i've got oscar award-winning anthony hopkins with me today he won't be speaking but <laughs> anthony hopkins is on this episode of the podcast is important exactly Everyone no no that. he's there to watch your levels it's a good use of his talent and also joining us this week is a person who spent her weekend rethinking how discerning she should be when people say you should come on my podcast <laughs> tracy harris tracy welcome to the show hi thank you for having me yeah, you know, we've been wanting to have you on for a long time. You've been on scathing a couple of times, and so we softened you up with that, and then uh, then we uh, pulled the old switcheroo. Yeah. Uh, so tell us, Tracy, what will we be breaking down today? Okay, so you had me watch the story of mankind, and um, I just want to say I'm not the kind of person that really enjoys watching bad movies because I find them funny. So it was real torture, and <laughs> I I guess it's just you know a uh, like a some kind of a cosmic judge and jury seeing whether mankind should be allowed to go on or if we should blow ourselves all to hell and all die. Um, so it was kind of weirdly like our future with global warming. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like we're, we kind of get to judge for ourselves whether we keep going or not um, <laughs> in a real weirdly cryptic way. Yeah, this movie was like it was the a precisely right movie for 2019 because of the plot and also because it was terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it, <laughs> it wasn't nearly as riveting as the impeachment testimonies. <laughs> no, no, doesn't doesn't hit that level of entertainment uh -huh. for sure. So, Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love the golden age of Hollywood. But a tragic landmine incident blew the parts of your brain that know what plot, story, and humor are out of the top of your skull. <laughs> you will love this movie. It's the story of man, kinda. <laughs> <laughs> well done, sir. All right, so be honest with me, Tracy. So you agreed to do this a uh, couple weeks back. When did you actually realize what you'd gotten yourself into? Because like you said, like the, the thing is, there is no hell in atheism, so we have to make our own. Right. You know, and that's what this show really is. When did you realize that? Oh, I, I guess, I mean, I knew kind of, you know, that it was about watching horrible movies and I know I hate watching horrible movies. And I guess, you know, when I knew I was in over my head was when I realized that there were like documents and things. And I was just like, Oh my God, this is, you know, <laughs> this is not just, it's not just walking in and just shooting the breeze. I mean, there's like, real work involved in this thing and and uh, i'm gonna have to you know follow notes <laughs> <laughs> that's right listeners who have been thinking about becoming patrons and haven't yet there's actual work involved in yeah. this. that's right it's not just us saying Giving away it. all our trade secrets <laughs> <laughs> all right so is there anything that you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at and and tracy you haven't done this before so i'll give you an example oh. i want to give it best worst title because this movie is exactly the story of mankind, right? Even <laughs> using the old school sexist term for humanity right there. Because uh, like the movie wasn't, but the, but the act of watching it was, it was terrible, mostly boring, unfunny, expensive. And in the end, it just seemed like a huge waste of potential. Uh, right? Yeah. So, story of mankind. I get it. There it is. Speaking of which, I was going to give it best worst understanding of history. Oh, <sighs> and I got to say, look. We have watched Case for Christ, so you know this movie did a hell of a job when I say that this movie makes your third grade social studies teacher seem woke 
as fuck. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, I think I get this, right? So this is like the best worst whitewashing film I've ever seen. Oh, yes. <laughs> Right? I mean, the whole thing was just hideously whitewashed. Oh, absolutely. It was, you know what? I, the whole time I thought to myself, this is what Tracy and I learned about history in high school right here. <laughs> this right here. It not only is it hideously whitewashed, everything that isn't whitewashed is in blackface. Oh, literally. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you, there's no escape. Now, I will say, can I say, on, like, on the good side, like on the positive side? I did not expect the twist. There was like a plot twist for me in this thing, and I just didn't see it coming. Mm. And I thought I thought I was, you know, down the line, had my mind made up, and then they they nailed me with a twist. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm I'm with you there. I did not see the ending coming, <laughs> nor did I. All right, well, I'll tell you what. We're about to be reminded that Christian movies sucked way before David A.R. White ever got a hold of them. So we're going to take a quick break to brace ourselves for the fact that America was never great again. And when we come back, we'll dive into all the ahistorical factoids that are the story of mankind. Hey, Eli, what you building? Oh, hey, Tracy, a uh, bomb shelter. What for? A vulgarity for Charity. What's that? Oh, Vulgarity for Charity is our yearly fundraiser over at our other show, The Scathing Atheist. When people donate $50 or more, they can send the receipt to vulgarityforcharity at gmail.com, and we do a roast of whoever they want us to. But why do you need a bomb shelter? Ah, I see. Well, so this year, we got a donor over at Modest Needs who's matching up to $100,000 in donations. And if we hit that $100,000, Noah and Lucinda are going to quit smoking. I see. And how's that going? Um, a little too well, if you know what I mean. Got it. Is there room in there for two in that shelter? Ah, uh, there is, but Heath called dibs. Who's Heath? Is it is the tall one? Right, he's... tall one. I remember now. Yeah. All right, everyone. Welcome to the first ever writers' meeting of the story of mankind. So you guys know the pitch. The soul of man and the devil debate whether humankind is evil or good. Like philosophically? Uh, no. Uh, no, I was thinking more like a series of vignettes. You were thinking about a series of vignettes about whether humans are good or evil. Yep. Yep. So no wrong answers. Uh, just throw out some evil stuff for us. Uh, World War One. Good. World War Two. That perfect. Uh, uh, slavery. Yep, yep. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'm filling that up quick. Uh, how about a little bit of good stuff to offset that? Um. Uh. How about? Nope. Not not good. C come Never on, guys. Mind. This is. E uh, how about the Crusades? I'm sorry. You want to put down the Crusades as a good activity? I mean, they had matching outfits. Matching outfits, exactly. And here's what I'm thinking for the ending at the end of the movie: the devil and the soul of man tie right sorry did you say tie yeah what yeah they yeah they tie you want the movie about whether man is good or evil to end on a tie that is what i said yes how much blackface can i do a ton okay i'm in that's why you're in yes yes it is <laughs> And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to start this off with the 11 minutes of credits that were typical of films of the day. And holy shit, what a cast those credits have on tap. Oh, man, the Marx Brothers, Heidi, Le I, it's, it is unending, the list of golden Dennis age of Hopper, Hollywood. That is Peter Lorre, Cesar <laughs> Romero, Vincent Price, Ronald Coleman, my fucking God. It's 50% of the actors from the 50s that I could name, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and Hedy Lamar and Agnes Moorhead from, uh, what was that, uh, Bewitched, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Peter Lorre, Cesar Romero. And, and I was, I saw it had David Carradine's dad. Yes, John I Carradine. Didn't, I didn't even know he had a dad until I saw this movie. <laughs> and yeah, you already said the Marx Brothers. That was so weird. But, you know, and, but the bonus, I don't know how closely you looked at the credits, but the bonus is Groucho Marx's daughter is in it. Yeah, making her film debut. <laughs> Woof. <laughs> Because she was a baby. Yeah, no, I, I would say this movie has more A-list stars than all the other movies we've reviewed combined. Yeah. So 
this is as good as it gets on this show, Tracy. It really is. Yeah, and, and I did. I mean, being like the person who is, you know, not really funny, I went ahead and my thing is just like, you know, more, uh, I guess, empirical. And so the first thing I did was Google the film, right? So I mm-hmm. don't mind spoilers. And I was just like, it's listed in the 1978 book, the 50 worst films of all time. Yep. That's where and I so I, I really wanted to thank you all for inviting me to spend an hour and a half <laughs> watching this movie. And still, somehow, Warner Home Video released this film as part of its Warner Archive made-to-order DVD line on July 20th, 2009 in the U.S. And I have to ask, why? Right? <laughs> right. Who was clamoring for this in 2009? Yeah. Hey, you know what? Let's do a special DVD release. And what can we put on it? I know. How about that one that was in the 1978 book, The 50 Worst Films of All Time? Oh. It's got to be on there. Do we have a mirror disc that we can burn this film onto <laughs> with a laser forever yeah, so, so that future can generations... For thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> Send it out on the next rover. <laughs> in fact, it would be great, right? Here's our history. Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, we put we that are. out on the Voyager, and uh, we don't have to worry about the Si Shin Lu version of Aliens anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so now, of course, this movie starts on the same line every great cinematic epic opens on. Once upon a time. <laughs> and it's so hard to explain the style of this movie to anyone who was born before the 1980s. you got to be like, okay, um... What if all movies were just a series of one sentence pitches for sketches that never got written? That was movies from 1950 until 1960. Sorry, we just forgot. I'd probably give you a heads up about that. Certainly this movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So we're in heaven, I guess. And we see two stars, I guess, that are supposed to be angels talking about how humans have discovered the H bomb and they're going to have to turn us into HR for that or something <laughs> yeah and they're not worried that like all the people are gonna die they're worried because there's going to be a housing shortage yeah they're like, worried about heaven yeah. traffic <laughs> yeah that was that was my thing i was like at least they had a sense of humor about it right and that you know like <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny there's gonna be a housing shortage because everybody dies and it, <laughs> you know and then i started thinking again about global warming and i was just like you know we've lost some of that ability to laugh at our impending self-destruction like we just haven't have anymore <laughs> well not here on god awful movies let me tell you <laughs> doom and gloom and global warming it's like you know can nobody see like the fun side of it right thank you you get it yeah uh, <laughs> half, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full kind of woman yeah exactly yeah. Um, also, there's a weird line in this moment. Uh, so uh, they're going to convene heaven court, right, to decide whether humans should all be killed off in a nuclear holocaust or whether we're worth saving. And they have they haven't really used the space well in heaven court. No, nope. right? we cut to this nope. gigantic, huge room with a lot of fog and stuff underneath. I guess we're on top of a cloud. We've got like 30 people are watching, but they're all 60 miles away from this poor judge that has to scream everything out. Not a great use of space. You feel it's like a Bruce Springsteen concert where they sell those front row seat things, but they're like backstage in the wings. I feel like that's what ended up happening with this courtroom. (laughs) It's like everyone demanded a front seat and it was heaven. So you had to get a front seat. So it just ended up as a six mile long oval surrounding this courtroom. (laughs) All right, and there's a great line here uh, early on in the court scene where they say that humans discovered the secret of the super H bomb 60 years before we were supposed to. Do the math. This was made in 57, y'all. So now's the time for the super H bomb, everybody, (laughs) in case you were wondering what 2020 had in store. Yeah, I don't don't know. I don't know why they thought we'd be ready for that. Like, apparently, they're not really good, first of all, at scheduling. Or yeah. anything. They just, just about 60 years, which is like a good generation or two. And I'm not the only one that realized that, oh, wow, this puts us right at Trump with a giant yeah. weapon of mass destruction. The first you know, person we're who supposed should. to be developed <laughs> during the Trump era. Like, yeah. oh, yeah, that's that's a good plan. I, you know, just go ahead and, you know, I'm going to say we're guilty. Kill us now. Right. Like, what chance do yeah, we right. have? But I mean, if there were any world leader who was going to develop a world ending technology and call it something as stupid as the super H bomb, it would be Trump. <laughs> so he's nailed it in that sense. 
Huge, the huge Super H bomb. <laughs> That's what the H is for. Yeah. So- oh, yeah, super huge. <laughs> super huge bomb. All right, so now it's time for us to meet the, the attorneys uh, that are going to be on either side of this. First, we get Vincent Price, who is going to play the devil with his Dollar General plastic pitchfork Halloween <laughs> closeout suit. And Vincent Price, okay, tell me if you guys disagree. Vincent Price is self-aware during this movie. Oh, yeah. He, every line he utters in this film, he stares directly into camera and is like, by the way, I'm Vincent Price saying this just now. <laughs> in case you're wondering who's delivering these lines, it's me, Vincent motherfucking Price. <laughs> and then, of course, representing the spirit of man will be uh, Ronald Coleman, who I wasn't familiar with. But apparently he was an, a real A-lister back in the day. This was his final film. He died shortly after, so he didn't get to see how bad uh, it was received good on him. <laughs> now, they, they try to call their first witness Adam, but apparently Adam has been, you know, he's defying the congressional subpoena or something here. I don't know. What? Why was this in the movie? That was a, I call my first witness, Adam, and I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. And they were like, he can't make it. He's stuck in heaven traffic. <laughs> yeah, and then the movie pauses to be like, it's weird. I feel like we got to write the script where someone said no to us. <laughs> I thought it was weird that our defense attorney was like this rolled into one, all the evil, all the good of mankind, right? Like yeah. the Rolo of, of humanity. And I, I'm like, so our, our defense attorney is like Hitler Gandhi. Yeah. Because that's, <laughs> That's really a weird mix. Oh, yeah, I kind, of, I kind of feel like we could have leaned in one direction for this particular spirit. But yeah, so Ronald Coleman starts off his defense of humans and he buries the lead. He's like, they have opposable thumbs. Huh? Huh? Also, the ability to reason I'm like lead with the lead with the ability to reason. Opposable thumbs are great and all. Don't get me wrong, but. But it's a weird opener. It's a weird yeah. opener. And look, he's going to do a terrible job throughout this movie, but this is the best he does by being like, I mean, if you need someone to unscrew some shit, humans are okay at it. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I did, yeah. The opposable thumbs have been a, a real help. Now, there was one thing I noticed. They did also mention um, walking upright on two feet, right? Which mm-hmm. was an interesting thing because um, there's actually, you know, this sort of, concept of human beings as being the bipedal animals or whatever but uh someone once said to me what about kangaroos yeah oh they're way better at it than us too way faster yeah yeah Yeah. we suck at this shit so now it's time for the first of like this whole movie is going to be flashback vignettes to periods of history asterisk and our first one is going to take us to the discovery of fire and the only thing the only note i have about this scene is that i found it interesting that the Female Neanderthal was wearing a cave bikini. That was <laughs> interesting yeah. costuming a choice. And to double down on the misogyny, we make it zero scenes until this movie intimates comedy rape. Is that what you saw? Because the caveman knocks out the other caveman and then chases the lady caveman and then gets distracted by the fire. And he's like, all right, I guess I'm not raping now. <laughs> Is that what happened in this scene? Okay. Uh, yeah, I have to go back and watch that again. I, okay. <laughs> All right. I just was like, wow, we've got opposable thumbs, we've got a wheel, and you know, what else could you need? Like, oh yeah, the H bomb. Yeah, super H bomb. Yep. <laughs> right. That's <laughs> complete the trifecta. I love too that Vincent Price shows up and he's like I am bored with this doodly do. Can we do something else? Which is how all the good yes. guy doodly do's will end. Is Vincent Price will be like, "You guys know I was in House of Wax. You ever see House of Wax?" <laughs> well, did you? I did see House of Wax when I was little. That really traumatized. You know, it was scary. He was a scary guy. Um, yeah, he I was. did notice though that he said he'd been dealing with people for about a million years, and I thought, so when did Young Earth creationists? get traction right if, yeah if right. This was like if this was common knowledge in 57 it's almost like we went backwards somehow right and he was budget conscious right he was just like oh the cost of these proceedings i'm like oh he's like a republican <laughs> in, 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 in the impeachment hearings um but then i thought about it and i was like you know even though he's fiscally conservative i'm betting he's socially liberal <laughs> right <laughs> Good. Yeah, good call. And he had a mobile phone. He yeah. did. He did. He was way ahead of the trend on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're back in the court. 
Robert Coleman has had his shot. So Vincent Price is going to call his first witness Khufu. Now, this is John Carradine. Uh, you may have known him as the voice of the great owl in Secret of Nim. Huh? <laughs> no. I feel like John Carradine also introduced himself no. that way. He was like, uh, remember Secret of Nim? That was the voice of the great. Well, where are you going? You going away? I, I had a moment when I saw him, right? Like when he came out and he started talking, I was like, I know this guy. I know him. And I was like, oh my God, now I know who David Carradine's dad is because I recognize him from the Twilight Zone. Oh, really? He was in the Howling Man, right? So, and, and I was like, how, how ironic that he played Satan. Huh. Yep. There you go. And in this, he's going to be in. Well, some form of blackface. I don't yeah. want to say full blackface, <laughs> dark tan face. Yeah, he's because he's the Egyptian pharaoh Khufu. You they see. actually call it brown face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, they do. I'm not kidding. No. Well, yeah, right, right. No, and he is absolutely nailing that Egyptian accent, huh? Oh, it is rough. Yeah. So Khufu and Satan have this back and forth about how Satan promised him immortality for a million souls. And Robert Coleman's like, that never happened. He's like, uh, excuse me, I brought a doodly do. So we head to Egypt. And at first I was impressed that this movie was going to include some African history. And then I realized that this was just supposed to serve as an example of human savagery, as all yep. the brown people in this movie will. The only actual people of color we get in the entire film is a crowd shot of people in Egypt, and it is supposed to be a human sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Khufu comes in. He's got his pet lion, also a pet Egyptian lady, apparently. Yeah, it was weird that he was equally petting both of them in the exact same <laughs> yes. way. Yes, yeah. yeah, she was like, yeah, they, they were like mirrored. You know, I was like, he has a woman as a pet. Like, this is really strange. <laughs> I guess if you're Pharaoh. Well, or or if you're a Hollywood exec circa 1957. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> it reminded me of Leia, right? Like Leia in the... Oh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, Star yeah. Wars. This is probably where Lucas got the idea. Um, <laughs> by the way, if you're not watching Mandalorian, check it out. It's the best thing that Disney has done with the Star Wars franchise since they got a hold of it. Anyway, so Khufu is going to tell us about his dream so that this movie can be boring to the second power. Oh my gosh, we have to hear about fictional emperor played by David Carradine's dad's Ooh. dreams. I don't even know who I'm supposed to fuck for this to win sense. <laughs> well, I was sitting there and all I could think was, where's Charlton Heston? Where's Yul Brynner? Oh. You know, is it Easter? Like, what is going on? It threw my whole calendar off to, to see this and it wasn't Easter. Yeah, yeah. So his he tells him the dream and he's like, I dreamed that I was in a big building and nobody was laughing. And his dream interpreter is like, well, that means you're going to die, but you're going to have a pretty sweet tomb. Right. Also, I have to mention this fucking lion. OK, so we mentioned the lion, but like this is the <laughs> saddest goddamn lion in the world. He so clearly wants to eat everyone that walks by, oh. but he's bored by them. Yeah. He's like, he's you know, like I don't know if you guys know this shit, but I could take down a fucking gazelle right. at a full run. <laughs> Every now and then he's giving the woman the side eye and he's just like, you're, you're with me, right? Like, you're the other <laughs> You want to eat these people too. You and me, lady, we could take them. Yeah. He's yes. smoking. <laughs> but yeah, ultimately, though, Khufu goes out and announces that everybody has to build him a pyramid based on the antiquated, incorrect version of how the pyramids were built, right? That, that assumed massive <laughs> slave labor. And everybody's like, oh, I don't want to build a fucking pyramid. God damn it, that's stupid. Yeah. But, I love how, how, but it's like he does it like literally in that same moment, right? The guy says, yeah. your, this is your dream. You're going to have this great afterlife, this huge palatial afterlife, but you're going to die. And then the king is just like, ah, oh, okay, right now, everybody. You know, he steps out. And he just starts throwing the command. We're going to build this giant thing. Yeah. I need to get the slaves. I need to get all the citizens, like, and pull the whole nation together and get them into fruit basket upset because I need this thing right now. Let's start. So there's, like, no, you know, no architectural planning. There's no, nope. It's just, like, just grab a rock, start building. Yeah, everybody grab and, a brick. <laughs> right. And I sat there, and I just thought, okay, so the ruler has a dream. And out of that, he decides to leverage the entire nation to build a massive palace to his own glory. And I just thought, you know, that is so far-fetched. How could any nation survive if it were led by a narcissist that conducted policy based on his own personal whim? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how long could that happen? 
Uh, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. All right. So we're back in court. Vincent Price points out that humans in general worship some pretty awful fucking people. I wanted him to doodly do down to a bunch of high schoolers' bedrooms and be like, see, Scarface, Scarface poster. Kid hasn't even <laughs> seen the fucking movie. <laughs> Look how many of them put Joker quotes on their Facebook. Look how many of them. <laughs> well, video games, right? Yeah. It's not even violent video games. It's just horrible. Well, and I love, okay, so we got the worst fucking lawyer Right. As humanity got such Robert Ronald Coleman is so goddamn terrible because he's like, yeah, Khufu was bad. But what about Moses? Right. He didn't massacre. OK, wait, hold on. Hold on. I'm just this just in <laughs> one second. Wait, Moses, I'm going to find a thing to say about Moses that isn't worse than the character we just introduced. <laughs> he. Moses, uh, well, you know, when he when he made people kill their own brothers and fed them a, a golden statue that had been ground down, he did it with the best intentions. Fuck. He's done it. Uh, dang. <laughs> and, and this is where we get the first of like the movie's attempts at pseudo history. Right. We're going to doodly do back to Moses's time. Oh, it's yeah. Just, it was weird. I, I I couldn't re I couldn't relate to our defense attorney. Like I kept wanting to call him back to the bench and say we need to we need to have a conversation. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> this is, Who hired this? this is, guy? I mean, this is not how I want to win, right? So this is like um, <laughs> this is like the impe this this is where it was like the impeachment hearings because it's like you're hearing the the arguments and you're going no 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 like yeah that that's not oh maybe it was just general corruption right no no it's it right. really specific i mean th this is not working and it, that's what i kept thinking here it's like you kept making these arguments and i'm like oh my god I, you know vincent price would get up and he's like arguing for my destruction and i'm thinking dude I, I'm, I'm with you yep. <laughs> I'm to right there with you. and then our guy gets up and i'm just like holy crap what are you saying like this is horrible that's awful. the best you have, man. Yeah, I wanted to tag in Andrew at, at, at some point in this movie. <laughs> but yeah, and, and so we get uh, Moses and we get Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. And Satan's like, yeah, but you guys broke all of them. And I'm like, yeah, but most of them were bad, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a double. Is it a triple negative if they break all the bad commandments as an argument for badness? Yeah, I <laughs> unclear. Well, and it, like they can't help but accidentally point that out, right? Because after he says the Ten Commandments, Satan goes, uh, "Well, you broke all of them. May I remind you all the war and rape of the ancient world?" And I'm like, "Nothing in the Ten Commandments against war and rape, buddy." <laughs> yep. Also, <laughs> the movie tries to distract us from that sentence with thundery keys. Yep. Literally, the movie there's thunder from God, and everyone sort of stops and goes like, "Oh, um, you want to?" You want to talk about something else? It seems like we pissed off <laughs> our own movie with our lines from this movie. <laughs> yeah, so I guess Satan's going to run and get a Thunder shirt, so they have to do a doodly do. And this is where we drop in on the Trojan War, not because it's an important point in history, y'all, but because they had some leftover B-roll from Helen of Troy that they could use. Yes! This was awesome. <laughs> Come on. They were just like, you know what the real problem with the Trojan War was? Helen of Troy enjoyed it too much. Yes, she was just... Oh, the whole thing was just so misogynistic, right? So, and, and one thing I noticed, like, when I first saw her, I was like, wow, Helen is awfully blonde for a Greek woman. <laughs> but then I, then I actually, hear, you know, here I had to go and do it, right? I went and Googled it, and sure enough, there's, like, a raging debate about whether or not Helen Troy was blonde or brunette. Really? What was her hair color? <laughs> I was just like, okay, so I guess... I would have thought that was a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah, but so, like, the, here's the, the fundamental error in this movie is that the whole thing, they keep dropping us in on, like, quick scenes from more interesting movies, right? Like, if I, I would much rather be watching a movie about the Trojan War, right? Yeah. The, yeah. This movie is definitely dedicated to being like, ah... Let me tell you the glitz and glamour of pre-Bronze Age. I don't know where I was going with this. Sorry. Look, we have 14 <laughs> seconds of fire footage. How about yeah. that? We lit a fire for this movie. It's like Can you imagine? The world. <laughs> they did have fire. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, just in case Tom from Cognitive Dissonance is listening, Vincent Price brought up the Etruscans. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> 
And so, okay. And then Ronald Coleman, though, he's like, he's like, okay, I'll see your Trojan War, but I'll raise you Socrates, huh? <laughs> huh? Oh, Socrates. awesome. Socrates, one, isn't real. Two, what? is super de duper not a counter to genocide. I'm agree with you on two. <laughs> I'll go with <laughs> you on two. I love two. They, they, they run out, right? They're like, what about Socrates and Plato and Aristotle? Those are all the philosophers we can name. Shit. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> But they, I mean, Aristotle, he said Aristotle named, named all the sciences and created science. Yeah. And I was just like, wait, so is Socrates and is Aristotle supposed to be on the side of good? Because I thought science hated God and was the devil's work. Yeah, it's unclear where this oh, like, movie when, did, when did Christianity get all backward, right? Because it's like in 1957, they're just like, oh, the sciences. And we all, you know, we're all down with the sciences. And it's just like, was it, did it, is it evolution that just, you know, set that thing on its head? Or I don't know. I mean, they had evolution back in 57. So I don't know what was going on. All right. So interestingly enough, I just Googled this. Ken Ham was born in 1951. So he hadn't had a chance to get to him yet. That's what there it we go. Now we know the cause. Yeah, it was about okay. probably around his 18th birthday or so when they completely went <laughs> batch. Yeah. <laughs> so, and they had artists. Uh, he was talking about art, too. Right. So art. And, and it was mm -hmm. like he's like, I'm looking at the sculptures and I'm just like, those are naked people. Like, what, what, what is Christianity <laughs> like back then? You know, what was Christianity in 57? How was how has it actually gotten worse? Right. You know, today, if someone says penis in a biology class, angry parents are going to confront the school about turning your kids gay. <laughs> and I'm just like, but, but here they are saying like oh look all these famous artists who carved all these naked people and i'm just like Wait, that does that's not the religion i grew up in i don't i don't get it you know and hippocrates they're, they're like illnesses aren't caused by god and i'm like wait can we force christians to watch this like can we make them look at this Right. Yeah. Right. They're like, and then the Hippocrates figured out that uh, religion was superstitious bullshit. Wait, I'm sorry. What? Whose movie are we watching are we, again? Right. Who's our point? I do. I, I have to point out this little scene, though. Um, Speaking of carving naked dudes, they have this one moment where they're supposed to show Michelangelo uh, carving David. And he's, he's the thing is styrofoam or something, right? He's carving it and it's just waving back and forth. Solid marbles. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just cracked me the fuck up. So, yeah, OK. But to counter all that bullshit about humans having science and, and Hippocrates and all that, Vincent Price pulls out Cleopatra's bra. Yep. It's time to blame a 15 year old teenager for the fall of Rome. <laughs> <laughs> it was so crazy. And that was the first thing I thought. I was like, what is with this gratuitous use of a bra to illustrate Cleopatra? It's so, the whole thing is so misogynistic. And I thought the same thing. I was like, sure, blame a teenage kid because she victimized the ruler of like the Roman yes. Empire and right. his general. Right? Right. Like, uh, she sure had them on, right? It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> they're not just like, you know, having sex with a teenager. Um, can't be she's manipulating break. them. And also, we, we when we when we open up the Cleopatra scene, we open on her poisoning her little brother. That's the opening. Yes. She's just like her and her little brother having a toast together. We are yeah. good friends and have no preceding conflict here. Have some poison. <laughs> I'm Cleopatra. Yeah. Would you like a drink? I just like to poison. But I have major <laughs> issues with this actor who played the brother. Was he told not to get his costume dirty because i swear <laughs> if, if we could get the like original shots of this there is someone yelling fall all the way down nick she's all the way down <laughs> never mind just push him push him <laughs> that was the most half-assed death i've ever seen <sighs> yeah <laughs> my favorite line in that segment was love and hate are really the same <laughs> it's just like, yeah no what no um, they're not <laughs> So, yeah, so she poisons her brother, giggles her way off to go fuck Julius Caesar and pick his pocket. What a villainous tart she was. And then we cut to her fucking over Mark Antony, right? Because everything bad that happened, you know, circa 30 B.C. was her fault now. Yeah, and Noah, I want to express my ad admiration and appreciation for you pronouncing Mark Anthony. Mark Antony? Yeah. Like like my plumber pronounces that. It was insane. The movie does this multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> They they did some weird names. <laughs> Wait till we get to Adela. Oh yeah, yeah we're right. Adela is on with Adela a little bit later. <laughs> I was like, what? 
All right. So the only thing I want to point out about this scene with uh, Mark Antony and um, Cleopatra is that I p- apparently back in 1957, kisses were measured in PSI. Oh, my <laughs> God. They are sweat. It's like they're doing a crash test dummy test with their skulls at yes. each other. They just <laughs> slam their dry, tightly closed lips into each other for a fork out yeah. and then pull away like they're undocking a ship. <laughs> no on-screen chemistry with those two. Yeah. Uh, so we spent a few minutes uh, with him thinking about how he's going to kill Cleopatra, like we all do from time to time, right? And then everybody killed themselves. Uh, <laughs> and they even give her shit for that. Then they're like, and then that cowardice bitch who who the <laughs> patriarchal government had stolen her life from and had given her no real option killed herself like some kind of coward. Yeah, exactly. They They try to end it on like a, can you believe she killed herself? Huh? <laughs> Classic lady stuff, right? <laughs> you put them at the top of a nation state, you invade them from four directions, and all of a sudden it's woe is me. Hey, it's 1957. <laughs> you all get it. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I've got historians in my family that I'm going to have to see on Thanksgiving, so I feel like I have to take a break to wash the first third of this movie off of me. But we'll be back in a minute with even more The Story of Mankind. Tracy, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, no problem. No, happy to be here. T Dog, what's going on? The tortoise and the Harris. What's the happy haps? Why is he talking like that? I uh, Eli gets a little nervous around smart women. I, I I think it's to do with the hair loss. What? I don't know. I, I know all about categorical imperative. That's pronounced cunt. Totally. Totally. Knew, I knew that. That was, was Eli, for you. Eli, why don't you just try forhims.com? What's forhims.com? It's a one stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. They offer prescription solutions backed by science. Answer a few quick questions, a doctor will review, and if they determine it's right for you, they can prescribe your medication to treat hair loss that is shipped directly to your door. Well, that yeah. does sound better than <laughs> whatever this is. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I was just flexing. Sup, uh, you want me to watch me open this pickle jar? Try Uh, HIMSS today by starting out with a free online visit. Go to forhims.com slash scam. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash scam. Forhims.com slash scam. <laughs> Prescription products are subject to doctor's approval and require an online consultation with a physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See a website for full details and safety information. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or pharmacy somewhere else. Remember, that's forhims.com slash scam. Ah. Ah. Did you get in? Nope. That was my shoulder. That was my shoulder. Blacking up. I love you. Uh, thanks for coming on, though, Tracy. Yeah, you said that. Wow, the Marx Brothers. It is such an honor to meet you guys. Uh, it's a no problem. <laughs> so so what will you guys be doing in the movie? Uh, what are your, like, signature skits together? Or uh... No, no. Uh, we all in three different scenes. Oh. Okay, cool. So now you'll be playing the piano, right? Uh, no, there will be piano playing, but I no play. Okay, so what are you going to do? Uh, Groucho is going to hit on a lady. I'm going to say the words, yes, of course. And Harpo... He's going to play the harp. Oh, at least he's going to play. That's amazing. For one sixth of a second. Oh. Wait, was I in this sketch? Yes, Tracy, you were Harpo. You guys are weird. (laughs) And we're back. When we last left off, we were blaming Roman politics on Cleopatra, and we're going to rejoin the action on a party with Nero. Which I got to say, honestly, uh, this looks pretty tame by his standards. Yeah, I was going to say this movie is trying to show us depravity, but like (laughs) they must have read a history book about what Nero did. And they were like, okay, uh, stuff that Nero did that we can put in movies in 1957. (laughs) And they came up with a lady on a vine swing. Right. Like, Uh, what a great job she has. Right. (laughs) Yes. I thought that we have laughing. We can have laughing in the movie. Yeah. Also, I have to say, um, we have the apparently pre-1970 international symbol of hedonism, which is a little person chasing an attractive young woman. Mm-hmm. If I had a nickel 
for every movie we've watched where they've just put in a little person and then turned to the screen to be like, right? How weird yeah. is this person who is different than us? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and so they cut to Nero and he looks as disappointed that he turned out to be Peter Lorre as I was. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Why did you do this? (laughs) Peter Laurie. Peter Laurie looks so genuinely depressed. There are undoubtedly 50 to 100 cuts on the floor somewhere of him going, you know, I was in Casablanca. (laughs) I am the Maltese Falcon, motherfucker. I don't don't know why I did this (laughs) to me. (laughs) He always looks like he's sad, like his face is melting or something. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he's got that pre-Mitch McConnell melty face thing going before we realized how bad it could get. Yeah. I also, now is the time on Sprockets when we dance, apparently, because as soon as we're introduced <laughs> to Nero, we end, we, we end up with this, like, four and a half minute dance routine. Oh, my goodness. And again, it's supposed to be like a sexy, lascivious sinner dance, no. but it's 1957, so <laughs> she's wearing a tank top and... Doing the twist. If you've seen the classic trek with the green slave lady dancing, you've seen this. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was that. I was just like, she's supposed to be green. Like, I've seen this before, but she was green. Right. Nero's supposed to drop her into uh, the Rancor chamber at any moment now. Yeah. <laughs> and one, one thing I noticed was like uh, the food, right? What was, blew my mind. And, and it's like on the one hand, I was I was kind of torn because... I was thinking, man, I would just eat the shit out of those deviled eggs, right? So they had deviled eggs, <laughs> but they were, on top, they were on top of a food, like a pyramid yep. thing that had like bread and, and bird, like fowl or something all around the bottom. And then on top were like deviled eggs, but they were, they were like going along the pyramid, like someone nailed them to it or something. Yeah. It was just like, <laughs> how do you get these eggs to stay up there and hang that way, like from this pyramid? And so then I thought... Man, how long have those eggs been hanging there? Because, I mean, I like double eggs, but not when they've been out. Like, the whole, you know, by, by about four o'clock on Thanksgiving Day, those eggs would start to get a little iffy, right? And then I thought, sure, yeah. I thought, are deviled eggs even like a thing for Nero? Were they like, were they? I, oh, they you know, probably, I, I forgot to Google that. I should have, because there'd probably be a big debate about whether they had deviled eggs. And then I thought, well, did they have the the sweet potato thing with the little marshmallows? Oh, you know what I mean? yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, I find that that's so fucking hilarious to me, though, that they were like, OK, so what would you have in a decadent orgy? <laughs> deviled eggs. A lot yeah, of deviled eggs, eggs obviously. <laughs> yes, exactly. Look, everyone knows you fill up on eggs after the orgy. Never <laughs> before. <laughs> the the jello casserole, right? They didn't have the jello yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Worms uh, and dirt for the kids because it's Nero. Oh, and of man. course, the the. <laughs> punchline to this is that when they walk out into the, onto the balcony, it turns out that Rome has been burning this entire time, and he was just there fucking around. And this is how fucking bad this goddamn movie is. They have Nero playing a fucking harp <laughs> while Rome burns. Like a violin, though, to his credit. You could, you could get Peter Lorre, but not a fiddle? And they even said, they, they even, like, they prefaced it with, you know, um, Nero was an accomplished, what was it, like, like, an accomplished musician and singer. And I was like, you don't get to say that Nero is an accomplished singer when you cast Peter Lorre. Like, you just don't. <laughs> but Ronald Coleman, he's there too, right? He's defending humanity. And he's like, yes, Nero was bad, but elsewhere in Rome, oh. there were Christians. It was horrid. <laughs> it was horrid. I mean, wasn't it horrible? It's like, okay, so this guy is burning down, like, the entire city, killing everybody. He's, like, torched the whole city. He's got his debauchery laughing party happening in the background. Deviled eggs are getting stale. And then he's out there, like, you know, going to sing like Peter Lorre. And the counter to all this is, hey, there's people praying in a cave. So, yeah. Oh my God, this is all you have. Balances it out. <laughs> that does not counterbalance like a, like a massive citywide fire. Like it just doesn't. <laughs> well, but in, but Satan's point here is that apparently Nero was all of Rome's fault because the Romans didn't overthrow Nero. Right, which is so bizarre, right? right? Like I read, I don't know if you've ever read any of the writings of Caesar, but they had this thing called the Friend of Rome. And what it meant was Caesar would take like a huge army and go to where you live and say, we would really like you to 
accept the hand of friendship from Rome. You can say no, but that means we kill you. And so I'm looking at this and I'm like, I don't think these people just, you know, quote, accepted it, right? Like (laughs) Rome was, it was kind of like, yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of coercion going on there. And the other thing is slaves, right? Slaves. (laughs) They're not volunteers. They're slaves. (laughs) They just, you know, they didn't stop them. It's like they're enslaved. Yeah. It seemed like we were doing a little (laughs) victim blaming here. Yeah. But then we cut over to the Christians. This is where we meet uh, Groucho Marx's daughter. She's the baby Christian here. Oh, oh all right. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. They should have put the glasses and the mustache on her. I right. Have yeah, that would have yeah. made it a little more recognizable. <laughs> but the, so we have a Christian couple with a baby and the man goes, Nero's guards are coming. We should get our children out of here. And the woman goes, nope, we should die for Jesus because he died for us. And the, and the dad's like, OK, sorry. Well, all right. Yeah. I forgot Jesus is a big fan of dying for no reason. Yeah, let's get on this. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, just stay and be martyred, right? For and, and you know, they didn't really explain that. Like they didn't go into blaming the Christians. It was just this weird segue where he's laughing and the city's burning, and the next thing you know, there's these Christians praying, and then guards come in and take them away. And you're just like, Wait, what? What? Like <laughs> yeah. if you are, if you don't know the story, you're kind of lost at that point, right? Like if you haven't read the book. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a really weird thing to say about this movie that's trying to present the history is if you don't already know all this history, you're completely fucking lost, right? Totally yeah. lost, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's just like, how does that help, right? Like, I, I'm still, I, I'm sorry, but I'm still struggling. Entire city burned to the ground, and the good part is Christians died. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so yeah, all right, that's, that's the positive human part of it. It's- and as if it wasn't confusing enough, it's immediately going to smash cut us over to Attila the Hun, who this movie will, one, call Attila the Hun, mm-hmm. and two, blame for the Dark Ages. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> First of all, okay, all the evil history in this movie so far has been non-European. Every woman we've met has been engineering the downfall of a society or whatever. So when they say Adel of the fucking hun and then cut to a screaming man in blackface, I was zero percent surprised. I was just writing in my notes. No, man, it's pronounced gigawatt. You know, <laughs> I give up. Yeah. But yeah, right after explaining that Christianity was this light in a dark world, they say, oh, well, let's fast forward to the most Christian time in any place anywhere in the world. Huh. The Dark Ages, they call it. Must have been a brown person's fault. Yep. Yeah. Okay. They called it. They they described it as like a horrible time. when Thousands of years of progress were burned and learning and medicine and arts and science was all lost. And it's like, but Rome is evil because of depravity and a oppression like i mean so basically what they're saying is like you know rome was really horrible but you know but wait there's there's adela coming along to make things horrible again yeah no right. Horror, right like here's some more horror and and it's like but but remember there's people praying in a cave that died yeah so right there's the so, counterbalance right i'm like wait, yeah. what? and let's not forget the angel's counterbalance to the dark ages is King Arthur. He admits that's a <laughs> fictional dude in the yeah. movie. It's, yeah. the be- it's like watching an Intelligence Squared debate. Whether or not King Arthur is fictional, he was awesome whether or not he was fictional. Yeah. <laughs> and here's the thing. I'm just going to say this, right? It's really funny to me when I, when I see these guys up there. Well, first of all, it's like it's all guys, right? So you've got mm-hmm. nothing but men mm-hmm. in the. I mean, there are people sitting around in the court that are women, but you've got like the judge is a guy, the lawyers are yeah. guys. Even Satan's assistant is a guy, right? You could easily have made his assistant like a girl in a, in a monotard, like, you know, with sequins or something. <laughs> but no, it's, it's just this dude. And uh, so anyway, I'm looking at this and they're talking about the, the Arthurian stuff and they're saying that this was, you know, once again, people have discovered human rights are sacred. And I was just like, only a man could say that. Yeah. Like, you have to be a guy because there was nothing about human rights in, in, the, in Arthur's court. No. Like nothing for women. For women. No. Right? <laughs> well, OK. And then and then after they come out of the Arthurian shit. In the in an argument in favor of Christianity being the light offered to a dark world, they show us a reenactment of the goddamn Crusades. Yes, 
Right, all of that culture that was burned down by the Europeans was saved by the people we attacked during the Crusades for no goddamn reason. Right, and he gets stopped during this by Satan. Satan's like, I'm sorry, did you just say the Crusades (laughs) are a good thing? And he's like, um, I'm sorry, do you like medieval times? No. (laughs) I need to pretend you said yes, because without the Crusades, we wouldn't have had jousting. And jousting (laughs) is fun. They gave me a turkey leg. This is my counter to the Dark Ages. Even in the the Richard Harris Camelot, right? Anybody that's ever even seen the the glammed up Arthurian story for Hollywood knows that it's, I mean, the, the whole thing, it's like, Oh, you slept with my wife. I'm going to have to kill you now because that's the law. And it's like, yeah. these are, this is human rights, right? And then what happens? So we have to kill her too, but she escapes to a monastery where she's going to be in a room for the rest of her life. And I mean, like, because you, I mean, you had sex, right? And I'm like, this is the dawn. This is the sacred human rights. Like, this is wild. Yeah. Oh, I, I love this moment too, where they're, because they're talking about the Crusades and, and um, Ronald Coleman wraps up by going, and like all wars, no one really won the Crusades. <laughs> no, no, the, the Muslims won, man. We're, that's why that's, that's why they live there now and we don't. <laughs> Look, I have yeah. a feeling we've got a conflict in Vietnam that we're also going to end up calling a tie. So I just like <laughs> to throw out there. It was really weird. It was like, yeah, remember, remember that tie we had with Hitler? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When we, when we tied with Germany, it's like no, you sometimes. We, I mean, I understand what they're trying to say, which is like you know, war is held no matter which side you're right. on. I get that, but it was just like a little bit too broad in general, I think. And then they're going to argue. Satan and the soul spirit of man are going to argue over who has dibs on Joan of Arc, whether Joan of Arc represents the good or evil of man. I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, right. I was twisted. I was just like, okay, so Satan Christ. He nails it again, right? So he's got a woman tries to break out of her gender stereotype roles, and then they kill her. Yep. And I'm like, okay, so is Joan a good person or a bad person? Because she hears these saints, right? And I'm assuming if the saints are talking to her, they're probably like her. But then she isn't being a submissive Christian woman. And I I mean, it's just like, I can't tell if if she's Mm -hmm. with the prosecution of the defense here. Yeah, nor could the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So and and by the way, this is uh, Joan of Arc is played by Hedy Lamarr in her in her final. Um, uh, and I, I got a bit of an obsession with her after Ooh. I watched Samson and Delilah. She is 44 years old in this movie. Wow. Woof. I yeah. look so much older than Heidi Lamarr. In this yes. Movie. Yes. Yeah, exactly. See, she I was- thought that was Pat Benatar. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I think for Pat Benatar like, too, yeah. actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, hey, Pat Benatar is Joan of Arc. That was, I didn't even know she was <laughs> acting in 57, but there she yeah. was. Yeah. But they did, at least they had, they had due process, right? Because they were like, first we have the trial and then we burn her. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Wait, but I, the shot of her getting captured is so good. They just show her on a horse and two guys come and take her off the horse while she looks at him like, oh, come on. Oh, <laughs> don't even get to ride it in a circle or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I already put in my quarter. God damn it. Oh. So, so they, they take her to this religious authority thing, whatever. And I only bring that scene up because the guy who's prosecuting her is dressed like Santa's formal wear, I guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He's like Santa went on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Prince Charles walks by playing with a kendama. I am really confused I about the Prince Charles was. shade in yeah. this movie. I just put I got my my note in here says, what's up with Prince Charles in that ball and cup game? Like, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know there was a name for it, but it's, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. To the, I should have Googled, right? And, um, yeah. They, <laughs> no, Kadama is the advanced form of ball and top. Yeah, no, he was. Yeah. You know, and she's, she's just like, Prince Charles, Prince Charles. And he's just like walking by, focused on his cup. He's like, ball. I'm going to get this ball in this fucking cup. <laughs> I think he should have had a paddle ball. That would have been really. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Right. Dude, oh, no, yeah. Get that thing going. <laughs> Modern version, he's searching for Pokemon on his new Switch. (laughs) (laughs) Pogo stick. And then, of course, Prince Charles won't help her. He's too interested in his fucking Pogo ball or whatever. And then we get this great shot of her being burned at the telephone pole. (laughs) 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 Ridiculous. Uh, All right. 
so Satan tries to condemn humanity uh, with the Middle Ages, but Coleman calls the Renaissance to the stand. And this is where we check in with Leonardo da Vinci. And they talk about how awesome the Mona Lisa is while they're standing in front of the worst replica of the Mona Lisa ever. Oh my, it's, a, it's like a paint by numbers they didn't bother to oh, do. It was yeah. awful. Also, his defense, he starts listing off renaissance things technically yeah but they jump backwards and forwards in time and technology start he's like michelangelo machiavelli the printing press the iphone (laughs) steve from accounting leonardo da vinci the kitchen sink i this was the point where i started to realize that i just had no idea how this trial worked Right. Like I was just like, I, I, right. I mean, if, if you're in a, let's say we're in a trial and we want to see if somebody murdered somebody, right. It's like, so you're trying to figure out whether they murdered someone or not. And you have people presenting evidence and you know that you've got like a certain level of evidence, right? Like, so it's got to be um, beyond a shadow of a doubt or the preponderance of the evidence or whatever it is, but they, they explain that to you. And they say, here's what we're showing you. And here's what you're trying to determine. But in this case, I had no idea what the metrics are that we're supposed to be using to determine whether yeah. people should live or die. And, and it's like they are showing these these different things. And it's like there's a certain percentage of what decent acts or decent people. And what is that threshold that we're supposed to? I mean, what, what are we supposed to be? What's our metric? I had no metric. Yeah. I just didn't know what, to, what I'm supposed to. How am I supposed to determine this? Right. How many Leonardo da Vinci's counteract one Adel of the Hun? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. No like, how, how many people praying in a cave equals Hitler? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, and they don't address that. Instead, they have this weird minor argument about whether or not Leonardo da Vinci invented the machine gun. And if he did, did he think it was going to be used for Good. <laughs> well, I just put I put the printing press and Titian paintings versus the Holocaust and slavery. Like, <laughs> I, I, mean, I, like I like reading books as much as the next person. Yeah, but, right. <laughs> but like, I would probably give up the printing press to stop the Holocaust, and I think I would be okay if Titian had never painted anything if we could not have had slavery. Right. So, I, yeah. If, yeah. I, if this is about what would you, you know, who would win, the lion or the bear shark? Right. It's like, I think that what we're looking at here is I'm going to have to go with Satan and say that, man, we've let a lot of really crappy things go. And then we're excusing it with like Titian paintings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hold on. But just to ensure that everything is in reverse in this movie, we shall now praise that paragon of human virtue, Christopher Columbus. Oh, that was so bad. And so that it can insult us on every possible level. This is the scene with Chico Marx. And they have utilized Chico Marx to go, so you're saying the earth is round? Cool. That's it. That's it. The problem with Chico Marx in this movie's opinion is that he made too many fucking jokes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so Chris Columbus is showing Chico Marx the route he wants to take on a goddamn Denny's Celebrate Europe placemat, <laughs> right? And uh, and Chico Marx is like, huh, nifty. They said I'd get $25,000 for being in this movie. <laughs> and then Satan's like, Satan cuts in and he's like, wait, 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 wait. Doesn't this story end with um, smallpox blankets, right? Yeah. But in, of course, in this fucking movie, the only example we could use of Europeans being cruel to the Native Americans is the Spanish. Yeah. Which which the like lawyer for p- humanity, that's his point. He's like, I mean, yeah, the Spanish were bad, but the English were they were never anything but cordial to the native people of the land that they <laughs> tell you what, why don't we cut over to the Queen of England and we're we'll to talk about the English did in the New World. We'll um We'll just cut over to the, we got, we got some of those costumes for the Metropolitan Opera. Who wants to see some costumes, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, but to be super clear here, in his defense of humanity, pointing out all the good stuff we should, we've done that should counterbalance the holocausts and the slaveries and all of that stuff. He's come up with so far the crusades and the colonization by Europeans of the Americas. Yeah. As the good thing. Yeah. That's yeah. their best moments. Yeah, that's when we were really killing it. Okay, so now we get a Spanish diplomat coming to see uh, Queen Elizabeth the first before it was cool, uh, and she is dressed like Bozo got a goth girlfriend. Oh, oh it is 
Amazing. No, you know what I thought? I, I, I stared at it and I stared at it. And I was like, man, those sleeves, right? So she's got, just to describe it, it's like she's got these striped sleeves where they're like, I guess, horizontally striped if you're standing with your arms down. And they're like this very pale pink and then red and the really pale. And it was almost like white and red, white. And I was like, what is this? And I just kept looking at the sleeves. And then she has this crazy orange hair. And finally, I was like, oh, my God, Ronald McDonald. <laughs> right? It's Ronald McDonald. So, of course, I hit Wikipedia. And I found out that McDonald's was founded in 1940. But Ronald didn't become their mascot until 1962, just four years after oh. this film came out. Mm-hmm. You tell me. Wow. And speaking of early McDonald's mascot trivia, if you want to have nightmares for the rest of your life, look up the original Grimace, right? Like what he looked like at first. (laughs) Fucking terrifying. Yeah. So, so Bozo's goth girlfriend wants Spain to fuck off. And the way they present this is Spain's like, but we want to take over this new world and of exploit its people. And England is just like, but we want freedom for all. That's their historical take on this right yep that england wanted freedom of the seas for all and it's like no england wanted freedom of the seas for england for england they yes were- <laughs> <laughs> dominance is actually what they called it sort of the opposite of freedom yeah. when you think about it yeah and yeah. she's she's gonna get cheered up here in <laughs> my favorite scene of the movie by a random shakespeare quote generator <laughs> shaped as a guy Yes, yes. So Shakespeare's here. She's like, read me some of your new shit. I need a distraction. (laughs) She says, would you like to hear something from Taming of the Shrew? And she's like, no, I'm as offended about it as people probably should be about that play. (laughs) Well, I love, no, it was, it was like, it was a self indictment, right? Because it's like Taming of the Shrew. And immediately she's like, hey, is that about me? It's like, uh, yeah. no, what would make you think that, Highness? <laughs> right? like, why would you assume it's about you? I wrote in my notes, you're so vain, you probably think this Shakespearean play is about you. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. But he gives her a pep talk, and that's how Shakespeare saved Christmas. What the fuck are they even going <laughs> Yep. For? The end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so England bravely killed people and brought fe- freedom to some rich white males sort of all right well quick before this thing goes full colbert report intro and it's about to we're going to pause for a quick break but first let me give act three the hard sell will freedom find a land will bravery find a home why didn't any history happen in china find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the inconsequential conclusion of the story of mankind What's the matter, Queen Elizabeth? What's the matter? Oh, Shakespeare, I'm so mad about this upcoming war with Spain. I have no idea what to do. Well, as I always say, to to be or not to be. Why, yes, of course. We must make a stand against the Spanish. Are we to be ruled by them or rule? Uh, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? That's right. We don't deal with summer storms the way the Spanish do. We'll blockade them from the new world during the warm tropical seasons. Pop on pop. Therefore, bringing challenge to the familial line trapped in the new world. That and a tragic grasp of Brittany is sure to force peace. Thanks, Shakespeare. This is in the movie. Yes, it is. Using an Oscar winner. (laughs) And we're back for yet more of this shit. When we left off, the white man was feeling awfully burdened. And we're going to pick up the action with them bringing Christianity to those savage barbarians in the new world. Yep. Now it's time for the peaceful colonists under John Smith. Yeah. Yeah. I love that back as recently as 1957, they could list and they cleared the forests as a positive thing that Europeans (laughs) did in America. (laughs) Oh, man. But once again, Satan nails it. He's like, uh, wait, wait, wait. Smallpox blankets, guys. Didn't you genocide the people that were already there so that you could bring in slaves? I'm like, my fuck, Satan's going full Howard Zinn on us. Go, Satan. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Good yeah, job, yeah. Satan. Yeah, I was I was watching. I was just like, you know, just 
getting myself clear that the good guy, the guy on our side, is glossing over all the land theft and the genocide, and Satan, who's supposed to be the evil one, is condemning all of it. Yep. I was like, wait, what? And, and then I thought, you know, if this is the only way to make us look good, we just need to go down for the crimes. I mean, <laughs> is, is there just some way that we can spare the people who are oppressing and then just H-bomb the oppressors? Like, Yeah, right, right, exactly. Yeah, it's time to throw yourself on the mercy of the court when the best you can do is, yeah, but most of them died from diseases that we just didn't know they weren't immune to. <laughs> right. <laughs> But they they probably can't do that. You know, they probably can't just kill some the people that are doing the bad things and, and keep the people who are doing the not doing bad things or not doing as bad things alive because they're just God. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. What do you expect them to be omnipotent? Or? Yeah. They need a much more specific hydrogen bomb in that situation. <laughs> so. All right. So now we're going to quick doodly do over to Sir Walter Raleigh getting beer dumped on his head for smoking a pipe because, you know. A humor beat. That's what this movie needed. I had beat. no <laughs> idea. Was that a joke? Was the movie like, okay, all right, we're, we're getting a little down with the whole a genocide thing. So one time they didn't know what a pipe was. Yep. Okay. <laughs> let's get back to some Native Americans now. Here yep. we go. <laughs> that's the whole yeah, bit. It is. Yeah. It, it, his whole pitch is about I, I, the whole defense of man as good seems to just be we invented shit yeah yep right like we invented some shit like including machine guns and you know. right yeah and smoking tobacco right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and just fyi there is a really hysterical bob hope skit with um walter raleigh if anybody wants to google it later it's really hysterical nice Will do all right, so now we cut, we're going to, Satan would like to doodly do back to the purchase of Manhattan. So we cut to some Native Americans as seen by Dan Snyder. Woof. And Groucho Marx, who will do the closest thing to comedy in this movie, but definitely does not hit comedy. Oh, God, this was sad. Yeah, this, by the way, was the Marx Brothers' last movie. This, this was the last time the Marx Brothers were all in a movie. This, no! Yep, this was, this was the wow. end of it all. Yeah. Just oh. like Hedy Lamar and, and uh, Ronald Coleman, they were never to be seen again. Woof. Maybe they thought like, okay, it's only downhill from here. They were like, guys, guys, we got to stop. You saw what just happened when we tried <laughs> yeah, to make a right. lot of their movie. <laughs> so, yeah, so they're haggling. He's haggling for Manhattan with shtick, right? And if I'm not mistaken, one of the gags, one of the running gags in this skit is that the Native American chief has smallpox and is dying. Oh, is that it? I mean, he keeps talking about how he's sick and he has to move west and all this. So, oh, oh no. I'm just like, boy, does massacring an entire continent of cultures lend itself to humor, right? Like that was said in this writer's room. Nothing funnier. Well, see, all my notes for this scene are just I know they th I know they know that Groucho Marx was funny. They just don't seem to know that Groucho Marx was funny because of the things he said and did, not like a, <laughs> not by default. They're like, huh? Groucho Marx. It's yeah. all gold. Yeah. I just had, all I wrote was awkward indigenous stereotypes. And then I put, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke. What does he do? Yeah. It, it was, yeah, it was really just strange to see the shtick. Sort of, you know, oh, this is so funny. We're stealing land from the Indians. Isn't this hysterical? Yeah, right, right. And their kids can't sue us because we're going to kill them all off. Yeah, right. That was it. And then, by the way, as though the, the Peter Minwet story isn't bad enough, they also have a bit where Groucho Marx, like, steals this guy's daughter, too. Yeah. Yep. Which is all the more offensive since she's 19 and he's, like, 56 in this uh, <laughs> right. scene or something. Yep. It's a weird joke. Let's yeah. just say that. It's also like, it's not even full lascivious Groucho Marx, right? Like you no. look at some of the old Marx Brothers movies and you're like, oh, that's, that's not great. But like, this is literally just him being like, and now I own this woman. They informed me this was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They informed me I'd get $25,000. <laughs> and, and I'm done. And then I, I, um, I just want to, Maybe correct myself. That skit for Walter Raleigh, it might be Bob Newhart. 
Oh, okay. Ooh, that makes, it right, makes yeah. way more sense that Bob Newhart was funny than that Bob Hope was. Yeah, it's no really funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so now we fast forward to the Salem witch trials. And then I think Christianity is trying to blame the Salem witch trials on Satan, I think. I don't I don't even know. Well, they were, they're definitely sure that the Salem witch trials caused the Black Plague. Oh, they have an art when they bring up the Black Plague. They seem to be arguing over whose fault that was humanities or God's. And they landed <laughs> on humanities for not cleaning up their turds. Um, right. I want to say that what was the weirdest thing to me was saying that the Great Fire of London was the overall positive thing because yes! it wiped out the plague. Yes. <laughs> they, they come in with like a who. Thank goodness there was the Great Fire of yes, London. Yes, yes. it really took out all those hospitals full of sick people. <laughs> yeah, that was, right, was exactly. Saying, what? <laughs> what? I mean, and, and my notes were uh, burning, pillaging, plague, and filth, and killing people as witches. Versus, right, that's the downside. And the counter to that is, what do we call things that fall down? <laughs> right? that was, that's the good okay so we labeled gravity oh. and that's versus like you know all of london burns and then we kill a bunch of people because we believe in witches yeah no trying to find the connective tissue in this movie is like the analogy portion of the sats but yeah now <laughs> we move on to isaac newton as played by harpo marx and i'm gonna make a, a a candid admission here i had no fucking idea harpo marx had red hair that freaked me right the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> this is, by the way, the best part of the movie. Oh, God. I, okay, so just I, full disclosure, I fucking hate Harpo Marx. He, it, like, every time what? he shows up on screen, I'm just like, oh, good. The comedy will come to a screeching halt for five minutes while you play a harp and do the same joke three times. Okay. What? Not a This fan. is, oh, this Gam 222, the final episode of God Awful Movies. <laughs> I care. This is Plum's poem. This is Plum again, all over again, Noah. This is Plum Gate. Plum Harpo Gate. I feel like I just walked in on some couple's quarrel. Yeah. You did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Tracy. I was just going to see I'm, I'm sorry. Sorted out. You watched 222 Christian movies together. You developed somewhat yeah. of, a, of a long term grudge <laughs> about things. But yeah, Harpo plays the harp. And stares directly into the camera, mouthing, Eli, please don't watch this. Eli, please don't watch this. Uh, and then we move on to the American Revolution. Yes, right, right. He's like, humans are bad. And, and, and then Ronald Coleman's like, well, what about America? And I'm like, whose side are you on? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, of course, because this is the movie that it is, Satan can't point out any terrible shit America did. He, Ever. So instead, he goes, yeah, America may be fucking awesome, and there's no argument about that, but what about those filthy fucking French? What did they do when we gave them freedom, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what, though? I will say that for the on the American side, right, they basically argued that the genocidal land thieves revolted because they were overtaxed, and that was real oppression. Yeah. Right? Like we were yeah. really yep. impressed. Um, not like those people we killed. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, if I'm not mistaken, we were paying the lowest taxes of any British subjects in the world. And, <laughs> and they were still oppressing women. And yeah, right, right. They were about to start a ferocious slave trade. Yeah. It's like, this was the good, right? This is the good they. But the, the freedom country. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it, Marie Antoinette has not been unfairly maligned by history enough yet so we should probably spend a few minutes digging into what a bitch she was right well oh, yeah. hey credit where credit's due this movie delivers the let them eat cake line like marie antoinette was doing crowd work at the comedy <laughs> cellar <laughs> they did <laughs> she was playing it to the crowd for sure and then so one of the things that made this movie so fucking bad is that no one could agree on how seriously they were taking it Right, because we just had Harpo Marx as Isaac Newton slicing an apple with his harp. And we move immediately from that to Dennis Hopper going for an Oscar as Napoleon. The the most straight faced, yes. dramatic, <laughs> yes. boring and dry. Like this is an it's like they clipped a Napoleon movie that ended up getting cut. 
Right? Yeah. Like this was his big Oscar bid for the year, but there was a fire in the editing room. <laughs> we'll put you in the Groucho Marx movie. Don't worry, yeah, man. It's okay. Right. It'll work just as good, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And by the way, I love this. When we come away from um, Napoleon, they have to represent Waterloo, which they do by putting a firecracker in front of a wooden sign that says Waterloo. Oh, my. They might as well just have a bang gun in front of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and again, coming right out of Dennis Hopper's incredibly serious interpretation. So we go back to the court. Satan's like, uh, yeah, but what about like, you know, all the wars that there were? And he's got a weird list. I, I'll admit the genocide of the Native Americans, the Mexican-American War, the California gold rush. OK, close weird. now, Satan. Close <laughs> now. You've run out of shit. <laughs> Not a war, not particularly a war. <laughs> but again, this is 1957, so I feel like they had a lot of viewers who like lost grandparents in the gold rush. They were like, <laughs> finally, they shall not be forgotten. <laughs> in the Valley of California? <laughs> yeah. What was that? Yeah, so, and then we talk about the Civil War. Abe Lincoln pops in to read the Emancipation Proclamation to us. Yep. Oh, yeah. They were like, you know, look at Lincoln, and oh, Abraham Lincoln. And I was like, wait a minute, hold on a minute. Do you really get points for fixing what you broke? <laughs> right. So, yes. Hey, we stopped enslaving people. Where's our cookie? You yeah. know, and yep. I'm just like, I don't, man, I don't know if you get a cookie for not. And you know, it's like, it's like saying, well, we, we didn't genocide all the Indians. So do we, yeah. you know, well, or or we eventually stop genociding them. That that's the thing is so much of this movie is like Satan will go like, well, you guys did this and Coleman will go, Right, but we also stopped doing that. That right. eventually right. ended. Right. History. <laughs> Nailed it. Canceled it out. <laughs> and then he brings up music. And I'm just like, yeah. okay, again, gravity is not an argument to burning London and the plague. And, <laughs> you know, people praying in a cave is not, you know, doesn't counter burning Rome and slavery. <laughs> And with this one, it was just like, music is not a counter to, you don't say, oh my God, genocide. Somebody else turns around and says, oh yeah, well, music. Yeah. Right? yeah no, well, <laughs> well, no, it's music and Alexander Graham Bell. Yeah. <laughs> and, a and, and, and Thomas Edison, who bravely stole dozens of inventions. I'll have you yeah, know. Yeah, and another paragon how, of virtue. How ironic, how, how ironic is the invention of engines that run on fossil fuels yes in in the age of global warming as you watch this film and you're like oh that was a good thing right like again you, like, humanity's defense attorney is sitting there going and and burning fossil fuels <laughs> yeah. Huh? yeah if this was done today satan would have just turned around and said global warming yeah right yeah. right would have been a much shorter movie but then okay so uh satan points out you know as Coleman's making his, the spirit of man is making his argument about how great Beethoven and Alexander Graham Bell are. Satan cuts in to point out that they are barely a decade removed from World War Goddamn Two, And worse even than that, jazz. <laughs> oh, yeah, is that what happens in the movie or am I crazy? No, it, it was like watching that Reefer Madness. It was really yeah, right. funny. <laughs> Yeah, so they go for a little Hitler humor. Uh, important rule of uh, comedy, Hitler humor comes in threes. Yep. Right? <laughs> also, was Zig Heil a call and response thing? Because this movie is pretty sure it was. <laughs> yeah, they play a little Zig Heil. Zig, yeah, like Marco Polo. Or I something. say yeah. Zig, you say Heil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got the little turntable action. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> And by the way, right here, they also cut in some stock footage from World War II as they're doing this in the middle of this movie with the apple slicing harp and all of that jazz. We watch video of people actually die, guys. That's great. A whole city full of them at the end. The bombing of Hiroshima, which I feel like both Vincent Price and the lawyer for the good were like, is that one yours or mine? Yeah, both <laughs> of them, right? Hiroshima I haven't listened to the Dan Carlin cool. episode. Yeah. Populated Where did we cities. come out on this? <laughs> yeah. Whew. All right. But just as things are looking grimmest for mankind, 
Ronald Coleman has one last chance to uh, change the jury's mind. Comes up and he says, first of all, my summation will be brief. This movie is already way too goddamn long. <laughs> and then he offers his ultimate defense of humans, which seems to be, but boy, after every genocide, we just get back up and try again, though, don't we? Yep. We are not all dead, which would somehow make us worse. <laughs> yeah, we just keep doing it again. I'm unclear. I'd like to call a baby to the stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this defense is the future of humanity. I'm thinking to myself, hmm, this uh, from a vantage point from 62 years hence, no, <laughs> we lose. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, because... Whether or not you like it, this movie was made in 1957, which means he is calling boomers to the stand. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, boomer, save us. Right? Honestly, yeah, though, sure when I saw the baby, it. I was just like, it's a baby, it's a baby, it's so cute. And he was waving. He was like waving from his chair, like over on the other cloud. And you see, like he's <laughs> waving at everybody. Yep. And I was just like, <laughs> And then they had the great clock from outer space that was like every mid-century sun clock that was ever on somebody's wall when we were kids. <laughs> oh, God, that was so amazing, too, because basically they cut in in the last five minutes of the movie and they say, stakes, right. OK, here's a clock. If you can't convince us that humanity is good in the next five minutes, we're going to blow up humanity. It's like, <laughs> oh, and most movies inject stakes way earlier than that. <laughs> Yeah, but most movies had more than 10 minutes of the Marx Brothers time. Yeah. So I get why they added it there. But Satan Price, man, he was wise. He was just like, they're playing on your emotions. He's manipulating you, you know, with this baby. And I was just like, yeah, but oh my God, look, it's a baby. And he was dressed like a little Kennedy. I was just like, yeah. he's like a little Kennedy. <laughs> yeah, but think about the year. That could be baby Mike Pence for all we know, right? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, yeah. Don't even. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that would you would you kill Hitler if he went back when he was only eight? <laughs> so yeah and, and so just as everybody's swooning over how cute the baby is Satan goes <laughs> out there and points out that the baby's playing with a toy gun and a toy sword which I'm with Satan that's fucking weird that that would be what the kid would have to play with in heaven especially it's <laughs> our exhibit right this is one of our exhibits yeah, so, right, hey, right. hey you know spirit of man Gandhi Hitler you're supposed to be you're making our argument for us and talking about this innocent little child and you like what you propped him with a gun and a sword yeah thing? right we know you have a ball in the cup right so right. you could have just used that yeah but then it gets even weirder yeah, yeah, because yeah, because the reversal is it's a music gun and a sword shaped pencil box. Yeah, and Satan says that's even more messed up. Right? Like, yeah, like, right. like a gun that plays mu music. Like I mean, now you're like just into, it's almost like having candy flavored cigarettes, right? It's just like yeah, hey, here's this, here's this, it's not really, it's a gun, but but it plays music. Child, here playing with the sweet gun. Yeah, so you're convincing them they're not dangerous. Great yeah. job. Um, but Coleman would like to enter a passage uh, from the Bible into evidence that freaks Satan out. And I'm thinking, man, you have not read that book. Like, like if we get to just randomly read something, it's probably going to come out on your side. <laughs> yeah. If you want to randomize a page, Satan, I think your odds are good. Yeah, I, I was right. I wrote in my notes like, please be the baby head smashing song. Please be the baby <laughs> oh. head smashing song. But it was instead just random shit. Yeah, it was really yeah, I was so ready for John 316 or maybe some of the pretty parts, but it's just like the Bible says, sure, there are bad people. That's it. That's what the Bible <laughs> yes. says. They're sure, there are bad people. Yeah. Just a weird. Yeah, I had I went back and I actually re-listened to the Bible verse because I was just like, wait, I don't understand. And I was just, I don't know what I'm missing. But yeah, I couldn't I couldn't understand how it related. Again, it's the worst of the SAT analogy questions, yeah. <laughs> and what's weird is they have this weird trial with no metrics and you don't know what you're supposed how you're supposed to be evaluating this evidence or what is it how it counts or can is there a point system? And there's like nothing. They give you nothing to work with. And then at the end of it you realize there is no mechanism for a tiebreaker. There's no runoff, there's nope. no right choice voting, there's like <laughs> nothing, you know? Yes. The, the big conclusion of the movie is that the judge rules that it's a tie. <laughs> yep. Were they just setting up a sequel for when there was more history or something? Yep. The jury finds man medium. 
Yeah. <laughs> End of movie. The judge just ruled maybe. And then he looks directly yeah. into the camera and he goes, the choice is entirely up to you just to finish off the goddamn reefer madness comparison. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that closes things off. We made it. We got all the way through. Uh, but just in case they hadn't already figured it out, I wanted you guys to help me out a little bit, uh, giving the audience a clear picture of the kind of historical accuracy we're talking about with this film. So I, I brought with me a couple familiar examples. So for these three, I want you guys to tell me if you think that this movie was more or less accurate than them, right? So all right. was this movie more or less historically accurate than Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? Uh, I'm going to say, no, I'm going to say medium. Oh, all right. Medium. <laughs> they tie. <Good. laughs> Did they tie? <laughs> all right. Was it more or less historically accurate than Yankee Doodle Bugs, the history of America as told by Bugs Bunny? More. I haven't seen that, but just thinking how they used to whitewash history, it's probably also medium. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Final one here. Is this movie more or less historically accurate than the current history curriculum for public Ooh. schools in the state of Texas. Equal. Equal. <laughs> yeah, it might be more historically accurate. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say, there was nothing in this movie about how Moses wrote the fucking Constitution. Okay. All right, so <laughs> this, is, this is my, well, here's my argument, right? The movie at least acknowledged slavery. That's but, fair. Yeah, yep. Right. Yes, there you go. There Didn't you go. Didn't call them helpers at any point, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't the transatlantic trade <laughs> it was slavery. Yeah. All right. So, Tracy, I can't thank you enough for uh, for coming on and, and hanging out with us today. It's been a blast. I know, like I said, it's a lot more work than most podcasts ask of you. Um, is there anything you want to plug while we've got you here? Yeah. Um, so something that came across my plate recently um, was that when I was back with Godless Pitches, we did an interview with a guy named Ethan Dodge, and he works with a group now called Truth and Transparency, and they are um, kind of like a, you know, a leak source for uh, religious corruption. And so they were doing Mormon leaks um, and a few other things, and now they've like broadened their horizons to Truth and Transparency, and they're just going after um, corrupt religious institutions that are doing things they ought not to be doing and hiding it. Uh, and so I went ahead and asked um, the guys, what are, you know, what were, what would be your, your elevator pitch? And they said that in terms of their biggest work, it's definitely the fact that Sterling Van Wagenen is the co-founder of the Sundance Film Festival. He's now in prison as a direct result of their reporting. And wow. they um, connected some 32 billion in U.S. stocks uh, to the Mormon church that I guess were, you know, somehow not accounted for. And then they exposed a sex abuse cover up uh, that was happening in the JW church. Um, and they do do a lot of JW reporting, but you can go to truthandtransparency.org and kind of see what they're doing there. The reason that I'm um, joining up with them now and kind of helping them now is that they're pushing uh, for nonprofit status. So they've moved to nonprofit and people can donate now as a charitable effort. And I just felt like it was sort of a positive thing for the secular community to be exposing this. When he was on, if you want to hear Ethan's um, episode on Godless Bitches, you can just look up Ethan Gregory Dodge um, for the Godless Bitches podcast. It was a super interesting episode where he talked about some of the ins and outs of lawsuits that they have to deal with um, in order to get some of these documents made public. So it's it's a very interesting and intricate effort and i think overall it's a it's a positive thing to get more transparency and more sunlight into some of these uh corruption issues that are happening um that maybe are staying hidden yeah ab absolutely i mean they did great work with on uh, the mormon leaks thing i was really excited to see that they were branching that out because yeah they, they are this is an entire inst or series of institutions that have almost zero transparency we we really do have to fight to find out what they're doing at all yeah absolutely so that's awesome yeah thank you that's awesome and of course we'll have that linked on the show notes as well if you want to find more information oh yeah sure thanks i appreciate it and well, that does it for our review of the story of mankind. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to lure you back in for next week. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, I was lost and alone because after all, next week is our Thanksgiving episode. And we already did the one Christian Thanksgiving movie until a hero came along and brought me a movie, a lifetime original movie called Pumpkin Pie Wars. Oh, no. So terrible that 
It may be the peak of my year just knowing you and Heath are about to watch it. All right. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 222 to the most close. <laughs> Once again, a huge thanks to Tracy Harris for hanging out with us today. And an even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors to help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among the ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review on iTunes and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist Citation Aid and The Skeptic Crowd, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm no illusions promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. America went on to be a shining beacon of freedom for all. This movie doesn't count because Hollywood had its thumb on the page. You saw, I had my thumb on the page. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.